Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Sevier. I am an audiologist and the clinical program manager for the cochlear implant program at UChicago Medicine. Uh, thanks for taking this time to watch a presentation that we have for our symposium this year. Uh, this session is going to be focusing on clinical objective measures in cochlear implants and kind of how we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. First of all, I have no conflicts to disclose. Hopefully, at the end of the session, when we talk about what we hope to gain from this, uh, I'm hoping that you have an understanding of what kind of constitutes a objective measure uh, and how we use those for cochlear implant programming purposes, what they tell us, what kind of information we're able to gather with patient complaints and how to help resolve those situations. I uh, also want to make sure that you're familiar with electrically evoked compound action potentials or ECAPs and their purpose and role in serving for uh, what we do in cochlear implant programming, as well as the electrically evoked stapedial reflex thresholds as well, and what their purpose is in cochlear implant programming. There are several objective measures that we can use. Uh, we're going to focus on just a few of them primarily when it comes to cochlear implants and this one because all of them are easily done within the programming software. They don't require a whole lot of extra equipment. Some of them no extra at all, but these are the most easily doable and um, useful information is taken from those. So we're just going to kind of focus on these three. First of all, let's just start off with what is an objective measure? Like a lot of things we do in audiology, a lot of things that patients come in with are subjective, meaning that they're telling us what's going on with them. And when we ask questions, we're getting subjective answers back. For example, if we were to just ask a patient, where does it hurt? That in itself is a subjective question. We're relying on that patient to uh, give us information that we can't confirm ourselves. While we ask them and they may say that their foot is hurting, it actually may be their finger, but we have no way of knowing that because it's something we're relying on from that patient. The flip side is objective measures. What they are able to tell us is we're able to record a response and gain information that comes from physiological processes that the patient does not need to tell us anything for. We're just able to record that information directly from the body, uh, whether it be through the implant um, or brain waves, anything like that. Um, but it's something we're able to record and get data upon that we don't have to rely from the patient's memory or them to tell us something to gather information. The reason we use these uh, specifically in cochlear implants are tremendous uh, for young children or other people with cognitive issues, they, can, they can't really tell us what they're hearing, how loud something is. So we're able to use those kind of measures to kind of determine that on our own without relying on that young patient or somebody with cognitive issues. And as they may get older um, for the young ones, they can kind of fine tune things go on, but it's able to provide us information that we need right then and there that we don't have to rely on that child uh, in order to make the decisions we uh, want to make for their care. A lot of times uh, with older adults that have had longer periods of auditory deprivation, we're able to um, better accurately record their responses. And what I mean by that, if you've gone for a long period of time with no sound whatsoever, increasing just the slightest bit, maybe a little overwhelming or maybe a little loud. So we're actually, able to measure that objectively without having to rely on that because they may perceive it to be too loud. They could underestimate or, you know, not really give them, give themselves the information they need to actually succeed with their outcomes. It also can provide us evidence of issues with performance changes uh, and help us ultimately determine proper stimulation levels. So we're going to get into that a little bit when we start talking about the different case studies throughout this is if a patient complaint comes in, and they tell us that they everything's too loud, too soft, things just don't sound right. We can use a lot of these objective measures to kind of hone in and fine tune that signal to figure out what's going on and helpful, hopefully help resolve that issue. 
uh, they can help us guide uh, through a difficult situation with complex cases. Uh, each individual objective measure can tell us a little bit about the auditory situation for that patient in different ways. So we just kind of refer to them as puzzle pieces. It's kind of like a cross-check measure when you think about audiology in general, uh, using OEEs and using your uh, audiometry and acoustic reflexes and all this. They're all cross-check measures to try to put all the puzzle pieces together. So we take a lot of those measures we do in cochlear implants and we're able to use uh, these objective measures to provide a cross check or give us some other type of uh, puzzle piece to put together. Hopefully we can figure out the puzzle. So there are multitudes of types, um, middle, late responses, um, EABR. There are tons that we could go over. Um, a lot of those that I just mentioned are primarily used in research purposes. EABR can be a great tool um, for determining neural responses as well. Just requires a little bit extra equipment, uh, a little bit more tedious to put together. But the three that I kind of wanted to focus on for the purposes of this discussion are electrode impedances, ECAPs that I discussed earlier, electrically evoked compound action potentials, as well as ESRTs, uh, electrically evoked stapedial reflex thresholds. These are, like I said, very easily accessible in the clinic. They don't take very long to do at all. Um, only one of them require an extra piece of equipment. We'll go over that when we get there. But they do a world and multitude in telling us information we wouldn't otherwise be able to determine without having them. Starting off first, let's just talk about electrode impedances. And I'm going to turn my camera off so it doesn't cloud the view here. So with electrode impedances, it is a measure of the opposition of electrical current flow across electrodes, leads, and contacts. A good way of looking at this is how well the electrodes are sitting in a fluid space. Um, it's important to keep in mind that you can have good impedances and it, the electrode array not actually even be in the cochlea, but we want when we have this measure and it is properly inserted in the cochlea, it can tell us how well that that electrode contact is making its stimulation contact with the area around the basilar membrane. Anytime that we do anything with cochlear implants, it's always important that you run electrode impedances at the beginning of the session. Before you do anything else, this could change completely your entire mode of your aspects of where you were going with that appointment, if you got abnormal results, they could have all been things that could have been solved if you just knew what the impedances were beforehand. And it's very important to get that information before you start and making any programming changes. Always make sure that you have evidence surrounding your programming changes. Don't ever go in blind, have it based on something. If you're, for example, doing word recognition testing, um, or speech perception testing. If you're making changes to try to accommodate for different aspects of speech, see if there's any consistent misses in an AZ bio test. Is it a specific sound that you can target to improve that area uh, rather than just turning everything up? Uh, with electrode impedances, a small amount of current is delivered to each electrode, and the measure is taking about how it returns back. So uh, that current returns back to the uh, ground electrode. So this is an example here. This was a wild patient I had a long, long time ago. It was a med -L patient. And uh, the first time that I ever run impedances on this patient, there were, some were higher than others. Some were turned off unnecessarily. There were a lot of things going on with that patient, uh, but it helps to know why. So I would also recommend proper documentation. Anytime that you decide to turn an electrode off, make sure that you document the reason why. That way, if somebody else were to see them down the road, they know the rationale that you are using to make that decision uh, so they don't go back and try to duplicate work that you had previously done and saved themselves some time. Going a little bit more in depth with our electrode impedances here. 
they can change. So they are typically the lowest around surgery. Um, during surgery, we do a lot of testing. And one of the testing uh, tests that we do during surgery for audiologists is our impedances. So what we're doing is we're making sure that there are no open electrodes. Um, if there's anything that might abnormally affect the patient's performance, we can find that out ahead of time. If there are multiple open or short circuit electrodes, and we know that during surgery, we might be able to switch to the backup. There's an incident that happened at our center three or four months ago. There was a cochlear implant that came out and it was kind of dead out of the box. So we were able to connect to the chip itself, but the connection between the chip and the electrode array had been severed and it was not able to run impedances. So if it's not able to properly run impedances, the proper stimulation is probably unlikely as well. And thankfully, because we run those measures in the OR, we're able to find that at the time. So like I said, lowest during surgery, they will be higher during activation. They are very stimulation dependent. And I will show you an example of that here in the next slide or two. Um, if you go long periods of times without being stimulated, then they're going to be a lot higher. So we talked about them being lowest at the surgery date. When they're low at surgery, there's no stimulation after we've tested it in the OR. So uh, over the couple of weeks that they're recovering before activation, there's nothing stimulating that area where those electrodes are sitting. So when you run those impedances, they are typically going to be a lot higher. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It's important to look at data logging when it comes to impedances. So if you have a patient and their impedances have all skyrocketed over time, make sure that they're actually wearing their implant because over time, even though if they had been consistent users prior to, if they're not wearing their implant on a consistent basis, it will cause those um, impedances to go up a lot higher and their outcomes might not be as good because of that. So the stimulation, as I said, decreases with the stabilization within the first couple of months. A lot of times when it comes to impedances, it doesn't even take that long. Um, usually the first couple of weeks, you start seeing them stay at a pretty consistent level. They can have some fluctuations with some other issues. Um, one of those I'm going to show you in a little bit. One of our case studies is kind of an odd duck, but I like throwing the weird cases in there. Uh, so hopefully you can learn something from that. And uh, But they may vary for a lot of different things. One, the first one that we talked about a little bit already is device inactivity. If you're not using your processor and it's not connected, you're not using it on a day-to-day -day basis, your impedances are going to shift really high. Um, just comes with an activity. No use equals high impedance. Keep that in mind. Middle ear disease. So if somebody has chronic ear infections, that affects the impedances as well. It could cause them to be a lot higher also. Um, recently read a very odd case about somebody that had chronic ear infections with their cochlear implant and they started having them about six, seven months in uh, and they had done really, really well prior to and they stopped doing as well and it turns out that they had consistent middle ear disease. After that was resolved, everything went back to normal. You may have high stimulation rates or out of compliance stimulation. So there is, when you run um, stimulation levels for each of the electrodes, you're gonna have a compliance limit. On some of the manufacturers, uh, it's automatically changed for you so you don't have to worry about it. So for example, in metal processors and in advanced bionics processors, they do an automatic adjustment that as you increase the stimulation level, it changes something referred to as the pulse width or pulse duration to keep the electrodes from going out of compliance. A lot of times that when you go out of compliance, patients will not notice any loudness growth in that area of electrodes. Uh, or you can also have prolonged out of compliance stimulation and it can cause tissue damage over time. So it's very important not to keep your uh, electrodes in um, out of compliance situations. So when we're referring to those automatic adjustments that can be made in the uh, Medel and advanced bionics softwares, if you change it to a manual and advanced bionics, you can also go out of compliance as well. In the cochlear software, 
the compliance uh, now, if you go out, there's little small ticks that go across the screen to let you know where the limit for that electrode is. And if you do go over that, it will let you know that you've gone out of compliance with an electrode and will automatically ask you if you want to change that pulse width to accommodate that out of compliance. Colds and viruses are also a big indicator of impedance changes. It also refers a little bit to middle ear disease. So if you have a cold, excuse me, <laughs> you have a cold, which sounds like I'm getting one now, um, you may develop some sort of middle ear disease or just kind of a fluctuation. So if somebody is coming off a cold, you may notice a shift in impedances. They may get a lot higher. Uh, typically, they do get a little higher when somebody has a cold. Hormonal changes. As odd as this may seem, this is a very real thing. Not too long ago, I had a second opinion come in and they were told that their daughter had been told by their regular audiologist that because she was going through puberty, it caused everything to get quiet for her. And this may seem like an out there kind of situation, but when you go through puberty, you're going through a lot of hormonal changes. And what happens with that is, is it also may cause the impedances across your entire cochlear implant array to raise. So they may fluctuate into a point where you're constantly having to make adjustments to get them through that period of time. Typically, if they're not noticing any performance decline while they're going through those hormonal changes, even though their fluctuations and their impedances may occur, it's okay to keep them at the levels they're at. If they do start knowing a decline, you may have to get them to come in frequently for a little while until that issue kind of resolves itself and make adjustments to make sure that they're still reaching their optimal performance. Uh, once those hormones stabilize, though, uh, you shouldn't have any more issues when it comes to that. Inflammatory conditions, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, this may cause fluctuations and impedances. You may also have fibrous tissue growth, such as when there may be an explant reimplant situation there's a fibrous tissue that pick uh, develops over the array and if that is torn that may shift the way the impedances are other things to uh, think about are when patients develop bacterial meningitis there can be some ossification that occurs so there are a lot of things that you can learn about the impedances or just the patient's overall hearing situation simply by checking what this measure is and it's the first thing that you'll always do so this is just a good visual example in a med patient of how significant the change in impedances can be. So this green line here on the bottom, a little pointer here, this was the impedance levels that were taken during the cochlear implant surgery itself. See nice and low there, they are typically lower during that period of time. Well then after surgery, this patient left, they're going to recover at home, and then they come back for their activation. So before you start to program any of the electrodes whatsoever, you're going to go ahead and you're going to run this impedance measure again. And when they did with this patient, you get this black line of impedances here. So it's significantly higher than the previous version. And because of this, we know because of our previous talk that the inactivity or the lack of stimulation lets us know that this is most likely the cause for this to happen. So once this patient is activated, um, they come in and they will have more of an impedance pattern that looks like the one in the green levels again, one week post, uh, that was very similar to what surgery looked like. Could be a little higher than surgery, but the point is they will reduce dramatically in comparison to that period of inactivity they had during the recovery period. And this also holds up if a patient stops wearing their processor for any given period of time. So now let's go into a case study with the situation. I told you I like to throw these little case studies in and I will tell you that the three measures that we're talking about today, none of these three case studies are one of the middle things that you're gonna see. So we talked about that inactivity or the fluctuating in hormones, all of that kind of stuff. None of these are related to the basic things that we were talking about. This first patient we're going to talk about is a 44-year-old female who recently was activated. 
her hearing loss it was very traumatic she was taking a shower and she had those extended q-tip like uh, cotton swabs that are common with medical professionals that only have the cotton swab on the one end and they're a little bit longer um her husband worked in the medical profession and he had brought some of them home. She got out of the shower and she had her hair wrapped up and she was cleaning out her ears with one of those Q-tips. The towel on her head started to slip and she jerked to catch it really fast while still having that uh, cotton swab in her ear. She jerked really fast. She hit the door. The door ruptured her cochlea and it caused her to have a sudden permanent hearing loss in that ear. She did try a Baja for a period of time and did not receive any benefit from it. Um, she had a goofy name for it. At one point, she did lose that Baja, and she did not like it so much. She never actually went looking for it or looking to get a replacement. It wasn't until single-sided deafness was approved with cochlear implants that she came in to have an evaluation, and I'm really glad that she did. So you'll notice here, this is a med -L patient, the three most um, basal electrodes are turned off in this situation. The reason for this is that when we were doing an activation with her, she was not perceiving any loudness growth whatsoever, and it started to lead to a little bit of facial stimulation. Um, because of that, we decided to turn a few of those electrodes off. This is also a region that was most likely damaged from the Q-tip trauma incident, which I can only imagine how painful that was. But we did get really good responses on the other nine electrodes. So you'll see the impedance pattern here. This was about a week after she was activated. Everything's looking nice, very well. She's starting to make very significant progress. And then about two weeks later, I get a call and she tells me that everything got really quiet all of a sudden. So she comes back in the next day and she is connected to our software. And our next impedance pattern that we get from her is this. As you can see here, if we go back and forth between these two slides, she had gone from electrode one, let's just focus on that, about 4.3 to over 11 with that same electrode. And that trend continues throughout the entire array. Huge, significant change. We weren't sure if it was going to be a permanent thing or not, so we let it stay wanted to check it out in another week. She came back and she told me that it has periods where it fluctuates. It goes from being loud enough for her actually here to super quiet and back and forth and there's no rhyme or reason to it. So if you have any idea, say it out loud to yourself, but it is not, it's not common, but it can happen that when a cochlear implant is placed a small air bubble can form. And in this case, the air bubble formed under where the um, ground electrode area is for the uh, entire electrode array. So that air pushes up and increased the distance and removed it from the fluid within the cochlea. So because of that, her impedances went from rather normal to this. So one thing that when we were reached out to the rep to find out if there was anything that we could do about that, she, um, our rep recommended that we do a massage like um, type circular motion on that area of the skull at the base of where that electrode is getting ready to go in. So where the processing unit is. So whenever things got quiet, she would rub that out. Uh, and eventually the air bubble resolved. And this is kind of, what her impedance pattern has looked like ever since. So it's always great to ask questions if you don't know that air bubble thing. I've had it happen three times since this patient. Um, you don't know if you don't ever ask and it's something to learn new every single day. And this was one of the cool things we saw. So the second time that we saw it, we definitely knew what to do. But if you see your impedance shoot up and her data logging was phenomenal, she was wearing it 10, 12 hours a day. So we knew it wasn't that issue. 
Uh, there is a measure, you can't see it in the slide very well, but um, in Medel, they have an indication of what the level is for their ground path electrode. It will say GPI. And uh, with the first round that she came in, it was at 0.7. It should be around 1.2 or lower. And in this instance here, it was closer to eight. So there was something happening around that ground electrode that was causing everything to shift. Never know what the fluctuations of impedances will be, but it also, while they were up like this, the stimulation had to overcome that increase in impedance and it caused our performance to drop until it was solved. Now she's doing phenomenal. Next, we're gonna move on and we're gonna start talking about electrically evoked compound action potentials or ECAPs. ECAPs are a phenomenal objective measure. And what they are, they're a recording response from the synchronous firing of a population of electrically stimulated nerve neurons. What does that mean? Every single electrode along the electrode array sits along a part of the basal membrane that corresponds to a specific area of a branch of the auditory nerve. So when we stimulate that electrode, it is firing to that little patch on the nerve or those neurons associated with that area around that electrode. So what we're recording from this is a response of how loud that stimulation needs to be or how much current from that stimulation there needs to be in order to evoke a response from the auditory nerve. This is a very underused objective measure. If you work with cochlear implants at all in any capacity, a lot of times what you see most common is either providers will test and measure out the upper comfort levels, whether they're M levels, C levels, or MCL, depending on which manufacturer that you're using, um, but the upper comfort levels for each. Uh, some people will measure the thresholds for all three. I'm a big believer in measuring thresholds. Uh, I feel just feels like it gives a more accurate um, response of what a patient's actually hearing. Um, but with this measure, it goes underused because it's kind of believed that you have a starting point with the T levels, uh, the threshold levels, and there is an end point with the upper comfort levels. So we don't know what the in-between for that is. So what we use an ECAP for is, we, like I said, we fire that current to make sure that there's a response from that auditory nerve. So typically, the way it is perceived is that when you have an ECAP response, we know that it is at least audible to that patient. We don't know if it's on the soft end or the loud end, but we know the patient can hear that response. One thing that I want to stress more than anything else when it comes to ECAPs, there are no one-to-one -one relationships between ECAPs and a behavioral threshold. What does that mean? You cannot use your ECAP thresholds to set your T's, your threshold levels, you cannot use them to set your upper comfort levels, your M's, C's, or MCL's. You cannot use that. Typically, once a stimulation, the stimulation in an implant patient has plateaued out, as we say, usually happens between six months and a year, your ECAP threshold should fall somewhere between your T and upper comfort levels. It may be more towards the threshold side of things. It could be more towards the upper comfort threshold side of things, but they should fall somewhere in between that range, but they do not correspond with one or the other of those measures. Um, we can also use the ECAPs to assess the status of integrity of the auditory nerve. What does this mean? What this means is, I want you to put it in perspective of somebody that we talked about a little earlier that has long periods of auditory deprivation. When you have prolonged periods of auditory deprivation, 20, 30 years, it takes a lot more stimulation if you can even stimulate and fire that auditory nerve. So with patients that have limited responses or they don't have responses at all, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not gonna be able to hear um, if they don't have ECAT measures when you measure them, but uh, their performance could vary. There's a wide variability with cochlear implants patients to begin with. You can have more on the 
sound awareness side of things, or you can have complete understanding side of things. But um, typically when we have patients that don't have good responses, they don't perform, they're not your superstar performers, but they do have access to sound and some of them are able, a lot of them are able to carry conversations, but it just kind of lets us know how well the auditory nerve is firing back. It's also a good response that we use uh, in the operating room too. We talked about using impedances during our time in the OR. We also uh, measure ECAPs at different various locations across the electrode array because it gives us a kind of a baseline what those impedances should be. There should be a little lower during the operating room phase, like we talked about a little earlier, but it just kind of gives us an idea of how the nerve is responding to that electrode stimulation before the patient even comes in or recovers from surgery um, and comes in for their activation. Use as a caution as guiding to determine stimulation level for maps. We talked about earlier, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between these two measures. Uh, but remember, it is if you have them, it means that something is audible there. So if it is audible, you know most likely that your threshold levels are probably going to be a little bit lower than what your ECAP thresholds are going to be. And there is a decent chance that your upper comfort levels may be a little higher than that. So we know it's audible, but you still have to measure and base those other two measures off of them. Very great tool to have. It's okay that not everybody has ECAP thresholds, like I said, but it is a good thing to use with children to kind of get a basis idea of how their map shape might be when you're programming that cochlear implant, but you can't rely on it as a measure of behavioral threshold. So now we're gonna go into a case study. This is one of my favorite patients that I've ever had. When I met her, she was 67 years old and she had been using her cochlear implant for four years. Very, very poor word understanding. Only got sound awareness from it. I met her at a CI support group that I was speaking at. I talked for about an hour and a half. In case you haven't noticed, I'm an extremely long-winded person and I can talk forever. At the end of it all, she got my attention and told me that she wanted to understand. And that's the reason she came but she didn't understand a single word I said during the presentation. And at first I laughed. I thought it was just something that I hear a lot because of the accent that I have that people can't understand me. But it turns out she just didn't have any understanding at all. Now later, more I talked to her about it, uh, she let me know that she had become extremely socially isolated. And anytime that she went out and had discussions with people, it was all pen and paper. So I asked if she wouldn't mind making an appointment with our clinic and there was something we can do to take a look and maybe give her a second opinion with that. Um, taking a case history was kind of difficult, but once we got through it, I connected her to the programming software. We tried to do some behavioral thresholds. Um, they came in around the areas of the 60s-ish, so not super great. And her word understanding was zero. She did not understand a single word when we tried using AZ bios or CNCs. I even tried hint testing because they're easier and she got zero percent on that as well. When we connected her to the programming software, this was the first map that we got. And on first appearance, this isn't an alarming looking map, to be perfectly honest with you. What you're seeing here, if you're not very familiar with working with a cochlear implant, uh, there are 22 electrodes in a Cochlear Americas uh, Cochlear Implant Array. And each one of those lines corresponds to one of those electrodes. The side on the left is more of your um, apical electrodes, the ones that are the most low frequency in the cochlea. And it works all the way up to electrode one, which is more of your basal electrodes, or your high frequency electrodes. That pinkish red looking color is your upper comfort level. Um, stimulation, which cochlear refers to as their C levels. And the green one that you see there is what your threshold level is with the softest sound that patient can hear. So there is a little shape to it. There's a little contour. At the bottom of each one of those little uh, electrode markers, there you see a little purple dot. 
that purple dot you can measure and run uh, your ECAPs on. And when you get a threshold for ECAPs, you can actually place them within that map. So this patient has not been able to have a conversation in a very, very long time. Um, so when we measured ECAPs, I measured them at five electrodes just across the entire array, just kind of see where she was coming in at. So in comparison, this is that same map, but just with those ECAP thresholds measured. So I want you to take a second and just kind of think about what this means and what we've talked about prior to. So if you'll remember a few minutes ago, we talked about once this patient is stable after four years, they should be at a stable level. The ECAP thresholds when we measure them should be somewhere in the range between the green T levels and the C uh, upper comfort levels. So they should fall somewhere in this gap, this dynamic range in between the two of those. And you'll see that the five that are measured here are all much higher across the array. So what this means is most likely this patient is being extremely understimulated with her cochlear implant. So we know that they need to be at least that loud for them to be audible to her. So after we made some adjustments, she was able and all these C levels were raised to be above that. We gave her two or three weeks to adjust to those changes. Once she came back in, she had gone from zero to 50% of word perception or speech perception. And after about six months, she had gotten into about 75, 80%. So she was understimulated and just didn't know the whole time. She had gone through a long period of time where she had lost her hearing. So she, it did take some adjustment for her because she thought the changes were a lot louder. And this is where good counseling comes into play. You need to know your, uh, let you know your patient, let your patient know rather that if you are able to take them out of their comfort zone a little bit, it will be loud. But one thing important with cochlear implants, it's loud because the brain is still trying to get adjusted to the new levels of stimulation. Once that brain has time to adjust to that stimulation level change, uh, the perception of loudness won't be as intense and the word understanding should increase as long as the neural integrity is still um, not compromised. So in this situation, uh, when she was reprogrammed, she did extremely well. And she had told us that that test had never been done on her during a visit. So uh, we've heard that a lot actually in our practice. So if you have the ability to do so with all patients, please at least the first few months run ECAT thresholds. So let's go over and take a second and try to remember what instances might we not be able to get an ECAP level, an ECAP threshold across one of those electrodes in the array. There could be poor neural integrity. You could have an incompatible internal device. What I mean by that is there are some internal implants that didn't have the technology of performing this objective measure so uh, in cochlear patients specifically, there was an implant called the N22. The N22 is not able to run impedances or ECAT measures. So of all those puzzle pieces that we talk about, putting there all the puzzles, pieces of the puzzle together, uh, those are two crucial pieces that we don't have. Uh, there's also an instance with C1 internal implants for advanced bionics they're not able to perform this measure. So in the event that you have an uh, incompatible internal device, you might not be able to measure your impedances or your uh, ECAPs, depending on the device. You could have uh, an internal device failure. Like we talked about earlier, that one that we had placed in and it would not connect to the electrode array. If that's the instance, you won't be able to stimulate and you won't be able to uh, measure that auditory nerve response along the array. And you also may have levels where you increase them high enough where it may cause stimulation or uh, facial stimulation or pain. Uh, facial stimulation is completely involuntary, means the patient has no control over it whatsoever. And it usually occurs in the rhythm of the sound that is being picked up in the um, 
microphones of the processor. Uh, it's commonly seen in eyelid beds, cheek muscles, or sometimes even on the chin. And any time that someone is speaking to a patient, it may cause their uh, face muscles to involuntarily contract. This is something you do not want to let a patient leave with. If you ever see instances of this and you don't understand how to fix it, please call someone. Um, On-call audiology, there are very easy ways to fix that. But um, because of that level, if a, the stimulation required to run the ECAT gets high enough to where it causes facial stimulation, you may not be able to get a threshold for an ECAT because of that. Moving along to our electrically evoked stapedial reflex thresholds, or ESRTs. This is also an objective measure, and it is a contraction of the stapedius muscle that be can, can be recorded by the introduction of a pulse train from the cochlear implant. I'm going to go over what every single bit of that means here in just a minute. There are pros and cons to doing this. Pros, as we talked about earlier, it's able to provide us a piece of information that we may have not otherwise known. In this situation, uh, ESRTs correlate to what upper comfort levels are. So we talked about earlier, ECAPs, you can't really associate them with a behavioral measure. With ESRTs, we can. The upper comfort level, upper stimulation level, uh, either an M, a C level, or an MCL level, they correspond more commonly with that. So you can actually use this to set how loud a cochlear implant processor should be stimulating in the map. Cons, there are instances where you can't measure this. This is a great tool if you wanted to use it in a child because they can't tell you how loud things need to be and that is an awesome pro to it. But the con associated with that one is kind of a couple, a twofold thing. One, Kids don't like sitting still. You have to be very still. This is very sensitive to movement. So if you have a little kiddo that's swarming around on you and you can't get them to sit still, most likely you're not going to be able to get an accurate measure of this. Um, also, we would love it to, like I said, do it on children if we could, on all of them so we know where to set their levels. It requires that you have a normal temp. So when you're running normal tempanometry, you have to have a type A temp for the proper correlation for this. Problem with that is little kids have, excuse me for a lack of a better term, junky ears, ear infections, fluid in the ears in general, uh, tubes. So if any of those instances happen, you're not gonna get an accurate measure with your ESRTs. So those are cons to that. The things that you need. So we talked about the first, you have to have normal tympanometry. So it is a response that has to be a type A. If somebody has an ear infection and it's coming across type B across the board, they're flat temps, it's fighting through fluid and it's not gonna be able to stimulate the auditory pathway the way that it needs to in order to elicit the response. You have to use your tympanometer also. So when you use it, we're gonna put it on acoustic reflex decay. You're gonna measure this just like you would an acoustic reflex, except you're gonna do it with a decay function on your tympanometer. 678 hertz and 1000 hertz are the most commonly associated with an ESRT. It has been found over the past few years that research has shown that 1000 hertz better correlates to where um, the upper comfort levels come through when it's being stimulated and then you're gonna present a sound through the software. So how this works is you have your programming software connected to the cochlear implant processor and it is on that patient. We typically uh, record these on the opposite contralateral ear because it just takes away things from that ear. I've heard a lot of people say that you can only measure it on the contralateral ear, you can't measure it on the ipsilateral ear. That's not necessarily true. We prefer the contralateral ear because there's not anything on it. But if you think about how acoustic reflexes work in general, it is what we call a consensual response. Um, so when you stimulate one and that muscle contracts on one ear, it's going to do it on the other as kind of a safety mechanism to prevent the sound from being too loud when it is amplified through the cochlea. 
So we try to do the contralateral ear first, but you can use the ipsilateral ear if you need to. So you're connected to the processor. You're gonna set this on decay. The patient is sitting very still. They're very cooperative. They know what they're supposed to be doing. They're not moving around. And you're gonna start measuring. So what I mean by measuring, you're gonna stimulate electrode like you're trying to find out where that upper comfort level is. So what I would recommend in doing this is try to find a roundabout when you're doing loudness scaling on a scale of one to 10, usually depending on the manufacturer, it's a six or a seven, kind of where you're trying to fall in between. And you're trying to figure out where you're close to that. To properly set it, um, you're going to present that same pulse. That's a pulse train is what it's referred to. And it's gonna pulse on that electrode. And when you start pulsing it, you're gonna run that decay function. And it's gonna look like an acoustic reflex, like this right here. A lot of times they look like saw teeth rather than a rounded response. You still want it to be the same depth you would for an acoustic reflex. And once you get that level, that is where it's set. The reason I told you not to spend a lot of time doing it from the bottom to the top is because you can actually cause a muscle fatigue response with this. So if you consistently stimulate and that muscle continuously contracts, you're not gonna be able to do it anymore because the muscle is fatigued to the point where it can't contract and uh, produce the response anymore. So try not to do this on every single electrode. It will eventually cause a muscle fatigue. Try to get a roundabout of where you're coming in at with this and then try to measure them like sparingly across the array, maybe four or five electrodes just across the array so you know where you're coming in at. And that's how you run a uh, ESRT an amazing measure. Once again, it correlates more with the upper comfort levels um, rather than um, what an ECAP can do. It falls between that dynamic range that we're talking about. So if a patient can't do, an adult can't do loudness scaling very well, or you have a child that sits nice and still and their ears are nice and clear, and you want to know how loud they should be uh, set at or what the high current level should be set at, you can perform an ESRT and it will provide you that information. As always, I have my nifty little case studies for everything. The one that I'm going to be discussing with you on this one is a seven-year-old male. Uh, he had been using his cochlear implants for six years before this. Um, very extremely sensitive to increases in current or volume. Um, he had been at a couple other centers prior to coming to us for another opinion and his left one specifically, he has not worn, uh, it was about five or six months prior to this because it was just too loud. He just could not handle how loud it was. So one thing that we did, um, uh, take a look at his map. He is a med L patient, as you can see. So in med L, they have 12 electrodes across their array. You're seeing the stimulation levels for all 12 of them. And um, typically, we um, the threshold levels are set to a percentage of what the upper comfort level is for these. But this person has uh, we had previously been unlocked to kind of measure what that threshold is. Those little purple lines across each electrode are the ECAT threshold levels uh, to what we were talking about earlier when it comes to the cochlear software. So we know, as you can see, they're definitely falling in between that range, but the performance this child had had declined significantly and they really weren't sure why and he wouldn't wear it. Uh, so we decided to go in and run our ESRTs. He was very cooperative, sit nice and still for us. We're able to measure. Uh, we did this very quickly and we were able to measure all of them actually before the fatigue set in. So we measured, once you take a look at the map, uh, focus on electrode one there. You're seeing the stimulation level is about 27 and a half ish right in there. And they're all between 27 and they go up for electrodes eight and nine, hit over 35. It's like 37, 38, somewhere in that region there. So when we run ESRTs and set them to where our ESRT thresholds came in, this is where they were. So that little tiny orange line at the top is what the ESRT level told us. So you can see if we pan back and forth between these two here, he was extremely overstimulated. The overstimulation led to him not wanting to wear the processor anymore. 
we were able to put him back on automatic thresholds and his overall stimulation level had dropped dramatically. Uh, in a matter of two or three weeks, his wear time had already skyrocketed. And his speech therapist had already noticed a gain back in his speech. Everything had gone well. We saw him a couple more times within the next couple months. And then we had a six month follow up with him. And his uh, speech perception had gone back to the level that it was prior to the issue starting. He was just overstimulated at a different center. So having an ESRT is a great measure if you're wanting to know how loud things should be and you just can't find that out. So to recap those, what instances might we not be able to get an ESRT? Some people just don't have the response. And prolonged hearing deprivation just like a lot of things with ECAPs not being great with it as well. Um, a lot of times when you hit your late 50s, early 60s, and it's your hearing loss has come gradually over time, there's instances where you just won't have an ESRT. No matter how high you stimulate it, you might just not have an ESRT. Um, and that's okay. So it just takes that puzzle piece out of your toolkit to try to figure out what that puzzle is. You may also have a compromised middle ear status. We said earlier with our kids when we have the junky ears. So if they have tubes, uh, ear infections, uh, eustachian tube dysfunction, anything like that, you're not going to have a normal temp. So you're not going to be able to properly uh, record this measure. Excessive movement. We said that this is very sensitive to sound. You have to hold still for this. So if you have a little kiddo that's squirming around or even an adult just can't sit still and they're moving around, it's going to affect the pressure of the tympanometer and you might not be able to get the response that you're looking for. And then you just generally, as we talked about, have muscle fatigue. So if you're constantly stimulating a certain electrode more and more, there are instances where you just start losing the responses because that muscle is just contracted too many times and it needs a break. Um, so it might be a good idea to measure a few electrodes one day, try to make sure that the electrodes are kind of spaced evenly between the ones that you have measured. And each time they come in, maybe measure a couple more, a couple more here and there um, until you start getting faster at it and more efficient with it. Try not to spend too much time on it because there's a higher chance that you could fatigue the muscle and you will stop getting your response. So in summary, objective measures are great. I love them. <laughs> They're underused. They should be used a lot more. They are, once again, hugely instrumental in telling us about audibility, or it helps us set our programming to what a patient needs in order to achieve their best possible outcomes. Um, if you don't use these, there's a wealth of information about this patient that you could help them uh, achieve their optimal performance they're just not getting. And once again, there's a wide variety of outcomes when it comes to cochlear implant patients in general. So this is not going to be an end-all, fix-all for every single patient. But if you're having trouble um, with a patient complaint, you're just not quite sure what to do with, or you're trying to figure out where to go to solve a patient complaint, if you have a complex case, run these objective measures. They could tell you a lot. And like I said, it's objective. So you're not relying on the patient to tell you anything. You can measure a response specifically from their body, whether it be the um, response from the auditory nerve or the muscle contractions of the sapedius muscle. You can use these measures to properly set all the parameters that you need in order to try to give your patients the best possible outcome they can. I hope this has been beneficial. Um, Complex cases and objective measures are a huge passion of mine. If you have any questions uh, about how to do these or um, need a second I or ideas for a second opinion for anything like that, here's my email address here at the bottom. I'd be more than happy to help you out with it. These are the only kind of patients that I see. So uh, if you ever need help, I'm always here. And if you want to talk more about some of the things you can get from the objective measures themselves, please let me know. I uh, hope this has been helpful. Like I said, um, use more objective measures if you're working with cochlear implant patients. And uh, 
it's been awesome talking to you and thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.